We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, and other moderators are not necessarily those of the IAS or the institutions associated with those individuals. Any mention of commercial products during this webinar is for information only. It does not imply recommendation or endorsement by those individuals or their associated institutions. The full disclaimer statement is shown and will be included in the archived video of this webinar. Anyone can follow the IAS Twitter at IntAdSOS for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please help expand our YouTube channel by subscribing. During the webinar, questions can be submitted to our speaker via the Q&A tab of the Zoom client or as comments on YouTube. Those comments will be forwarded to the Zoom hosts. Questions will be uh, taken specifically about one half of the way through the webinar. Uh, we'll, we'll pause and allow uh, Professor Mazzotti to address questions at that point. I'm now pleased to introduce today's speaker, Professor, Professor Marco Mazzotti of the Department of Mechanical and Process Engineering at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Professor Mazzotti is an internationally known expert in chemical engineering processes based on adsorption, chromatography, crystallization, and precipitation with particular areas of interest in, in purification of biopharmaceuticals and CO2 capture and storage. He is the executive editor of Chemical Engineering Science, contributed to the IPCC report on carbon capture and storage, and of particular interest to us as a fellow and past president of the International Adsorption Society, as well as the organizer of the ninth Fundamentals of Adsorption meeting, which was held in Sicily in 2007. Today, he will present work and his thoughts on the challenge of a net zero CO2 emissions chemical industry and the role of direct air capture by adsorption. And now presentation control is being handed over to Professor Mazzotti and he'll begin his presentation. So good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you very much, Dan, for the introduction. Um, thank you um, and uh, thank to Arvind Rajendran for organizing this series of uh, webinars. I think it's a great initiative and I'm really honored to be part of it. Um, and I'm thrilled and also a little nervous because I'm the first. <clears throat> uh, so before I start, I would, I would be happy to receive a, a hint uh, that from you that uh, everything is going well and that you can hear me well, so that I will be, um, I, I, I will go on uh, knowing that it works well. You see my screen and you hear me well. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So um, let me tell you my storyline. Um, I'm going to start by uh, explaining what I mean by, the, by a net zero CO2 emissions world and why we need it. Then I will um, have um, three chapters of my presentation about tools, technologies that we need to enable a net zero CO2 emissions chemical industry, which is the focus of my talk. And I will also show you how CCS, CCU, and data capture are important in related sectors. And finally, I will draw conclusions. So let me start with the, with the first. So um, if our goal as it is, um, is that of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade, um, we will need uh, uh, a world that uh, um, uh, that reaches the net zero CO2 emissions, and we will also need the negative emission technologies. We can see it here. Um, I mean, there are many ways uh, to, to decarbonize our society, and um, there are different scenarios. One way of representing this um, is what uh, the IPCC, in his, uh, for example, in his uh, latest report on uh, um, 1.5 degrees, uh, does. So they show how the annual CO2 emissions on the vertical axis should evolve in time over the century um, to go from where we are today, about 40 gigatons per year, down uh, following this uh, net path that goes to zero and even below zero. How can we uh, achieve this? Well, we need to decarbonize basically all sectors of our society, power generation, mobility, households, industry with major reductions, but also agriculture, and maybe we have to change our lifestyle. And this will bring us down along this path, um, but there are sectors that will never be able to go to zero. There are unavoidable emissions, for example, from the chemical industry, from aviation. Um, so, but uh, the, the 1.5 degree goal requires 
that we bring emissions to zero. So you see around the mid of the century, we reach this point where actually in all sectors and for everybody in our world, we will have to be net zero CO2 emissions and we will have to implement the net zero CO2 emissions solutions. And, uh, but this is not enough because you see that, the, that uh, in order to compensate for the unavoidable emissions um, and also to get back if we have overshot the uh, 1.5 degree um, objective, we will need uh, to implement so-called negative emission technologies that allow us to remove um, CO2 from the atmosphere. And these involve bioenergy using CCS, direct air capture with CCS, and CCS is carbon capture and storage that, by the, by the way, is needed to um, cover this orange part of the emission reduction, um, which is emissions avoided through fossil fuel in the industry uh, by uh, CCS. So uh, in this context, uh, I would like to discuss with you what CCS is and what direct air capture is. And this is my second part of the presentation. Let's talk about carbon dioxide capture and storage systems. Uh, there have been uh, all over the world many operations, uh, not only um, research and tests, but also industrial uh, commercial operations of uh, uh, CCS. And you see them indicated with, this, uh, um, with these uh, symbols. Uh, all over the place. The, the biggest and most recent one uh, started um, a couple of years ago in uh, Australia, in Gorgon, uh, where they inject 4 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, looking at Europe, we don't see operations in, the, uh, in continental Europe for a number of reasons, but we see them in the North Sea. And uh, Europe, uh, the European Union plans uh, to have a CO2 storage hub in the North Sea uh, very soon. It's called Northern Lights that will allow for example, us in Switzerland to capture CO2, transport it and store it there. So this is a set of technologies that is well known. Um, let me uh, show you an example, a specific example from Canada, the Boundary Dam CCS project. It's a coal fire power plant where uh, CO2 is captured before the flue gas is emitted. Uh, so this is the power plant and this is the capture unit. Then the CO2 is compressed, transported and stored underground. Um, very deep underground in a suitable geological formation, um, typically saline aquifer, where there are multiple trapping mechanisms that can keep uh, CO2 down there basically forever. Some, some data, the, uh, the plant, uh, the coal fire power plant has a, a net power output of 120 megawatt, post-combustion capture, um, of 1 million tons of CO2 per year uses the Kansov technology, which is essentially aiming scrubbing, scrubbing and uh, CO2 can be stored in aquifer, as indicated here, or can be used for enhanced oil recovery. And the plant, this specific example, has been operational for um, several years. Um, this is a technology used to avoid emissions, avoid emissions when CO2 is generated. But we can also capture CO2 directly from air. This is direct air capture. This is a plant in Switzerland operated by I mean, built and operated by Climeworks. Um, now, uh, this plant captures 1.5 tons, sorry, uh, 1,500 tons of CO2 per year. Um, so basically 1,000 of, of, of this post-combustion capture plant. Uh, it uses vacuum temperature swing adsorption as um, technology. Regeneration uh, of the adsorbent is carried out with or without steam at 100 degrees centigrade. And in this particular case, CO2 is captured from air and fed to this greenhouse that you see here uh, through a pipeline. And this has been operational for uh, three years now. The purpose here is really to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and uh, in the future, hopefully, to store it underground. Now, um, so these are existing technologies and maybe the most uh, debated part of it is the storage. So is underground storage of CO2 really safe? And I and the, 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 the geologists who are better expert uh, of this um, argue that yes, at least for five reasons. Well, first of all, there is a climate protection reason. Putting CO2 in deep geological formations like this one is a lot safer and better than putting the same amount of CO2 into the atmosphere, where we know that it causes, um, uh, well, serious and immediate uh, damage. Uh, then there is a physical basis to, uh, to justify uh, this confidence. CO2 is trapped in, I mean, a saline aquifer is a porous structure. It looks like a rock. Uh, and CO2 is stored 
in the in the pores of this of this rock uh, by the same processes that have trapped the natural gas for millions of years. Third, we have operational experience. We have operated, for example, the site, this site in Sleipner since 1996. I mean, not we. I mean, the the actually Equinor, the Norwegian. Um, oil and gas company. Um, now Sleipner is, a, is a, this offshore platform in this uh, position between Scotland and Norway. And um, uh, it uh, produces gas, natural gas from a deep um, uh, reservoir. Natural gas contains some CO2 that has to be removed. This is done on the platform itself so that natural gas can be delivered to the shore. And CO2 is re-injected underground in, in, in the formation that you see here, which is a, which is an aquifer, a saline aquifer, um, sealed by a cap rock that is on top of it. You see it's 1,000 meters below the seafloor. It's perfectly sealed. It's a huge formation. You see its footprint in this uh, map here. And um, that, that can host uh, CO2 um, uh, for, for forever in principle. We have, um, or they have, uh, uh, carefully monitored what happens to the CO2 um, after injection. And um, we see the results of this monitoring work uh, in this slide. Um, these are seismic uh, uh, data. Uh, we have uh, vertical slices here and the corresponding horizontal slices here uh, taken at, uh, at this uh, depth. Now, the vertical coordinate here is the depth. Um, what you see um, in time, injection started there in 1996. So 1994 is basically the, 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 the reference, the, the background um, uh, measurement. And then as CO2 is injected, we see that uh, the signal that this um, measurement receives uh, changes because of the change of the density of the formation. And we see that CO2 remains contained below uh, the cap rock but it expands and we see even better how it expands horizontally because it, it can only go upwards until it reaches the cap rock and then it's spread horizontally. What is important here is that these 4D seismic um, measurements show clearly that CO2 migration has followed the design specifications. And this is true for Slapner and for um, the other sites uh, where CO2 has been injected underground. So we have operational experience and we have geophysical monitoring that tell us that indeed the CO2 uh, is, can be safely stored um, in the uh, intended reservoir unit. And uh, well, this allows also to have uh, um, to fulfill regulatory compliance uh, for this operation. Now, uh, I, I, CO2 capture and storage means uh, putting the CO2 away for good. But um, many argue that this should not be done. Maybe CO2 could be reused. And that's the, the, the second set of technologies that I would like to discuss. So the possibility of capturing CO2, but then utilizing it. Now, a CCU system is a system that consists at least of four steps. The capture of CO2, the conversion of CO2 to a carbon-rich product that has some, some value, some function, and that is utilized. Um, when utilized, it produces a waste that has to be then uh, disposed of. And typically, uh, this waste is, uh, is a CO2. Um, and um, now, CCU is important for the chemical industry. C uh, CO2 is advocated to be a potential sustainable source material for carbon-based chemicals. And catalysis for CO2 conversion for this step is advocated to be the ultimate challenge in a way. But we have to keep in mind that if we take, for example, methane as a carbon-rich product, there is a big energy gap between CO2 and, and methane. And uh, that's why when we, when we use methane and we burn it, we obtain energy. But of course, uh, um, because of the second law of thermodynamics, we, we cannot uh, obtain the whole amount of energy. We have a, a power output that can be about 60% from a gas-fired power plant. Now, if we want to take the CO2 produced by combustion and um, uh, convert it back to, to methane, again, we are going to fight a lost battle with uh, the second law of thermodynamics. So we will need a much higher energy input. These are approximated numbers, but not so far from, from reality. So if you want really to play with this cycle, you one has to make to, to, to take into account that the amount of energy that one can, can, can gain has to be compensated by a much higher amount of energy that, of course, has to be 
perfectly carbon free for the whole thing to make sense. So CO2 conversion needs a lot of energy and uh, it's in itself a, a multi-step process where we have to harvest carbon free renewable electricity um, to generate power that, um, that is used first of all for hydrogen synthesis. Most of the schemes um, for CO2 conversion um, require reaction, involve a reaction of, of CO2 with hydrogen. Um, so green hydrogen, because it's, pro it's produced using carbon-free renewables. Now, in order to understand whether this um, uh, concept can be useful, it's important to keep in mind what type of service we would like to deliver by uh, using the carbon-rich product uh, that, uh, that um, we might uh, produce from CO2. And the services that I want to keep in mind in the, fall, in the, in the next slides that I'm going to show you are power generation and distribution, um, fuels and power for transport, uh, also long-term, long-range storage, um, sorry, long-term storage and long-range transport of renewable um, electricity that uh, in, many cases, in many cases is produced in, a, in an intermittent way. And of course, uh, the production of, of chemical products and materials. So the third set of, uh, uh, of technologies that I, I want to um, have in my portfolio before starting to talk about the chemical industry is direct air capture. And I would like to start by saying that um, nowadays there are essentially two concepts, one based on absorption and one based on absorption. And um, uh, the, the one based on absorption, um, the company Climeworks is, is implementing it uh, the company Global Thermostat as well. You have seen the plant of Climeworks. You see here the plant uh, the Global Thermostat in the US has installed. Um, and the concept is pretty simple. We, we flow air uh, through a, a, a box containing an adsorbent that captures the black CO2 and lets uh, um, uh, CO2 free air go, up, go through. Then when the adsorbent is saturated, we need to regenerate it using low temperature heat, possibly coming from renewables and we obtain a, a pure stream of CO2. The process based on absorption works uh, um, a little differently. We, the, the air is, uh, is um, basically it's a scrubbing process, well, but the capture solution has to be a, a sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide solution because of the low concentration of CO2 in air. Um, and uh, this solution in order to recover the solution itself needs uh, to be um, freed of CO2, and this can be done only by reaction with calcium oxide to form calcium carbonate uh, that precipitates. And this calcium carbonate has to be regenerated in turn by uh, calcination. And this, of course, requires a lot of energy, as you see here, um, and requires high temperature. So basically, we have on the one hand adsorption and desorption at a maximum of 90, 100 degrees. And uh, here we have absorption and calcination up to 900 degrees. And this is promoted and uh, offered today by the company, uh, the Canadian company, Carbon Engineering. Um, I personally hope that there will be more technologies coming up in the future. But of course, today, in the context of this talk, and also that's the, what we do in our research, I would like to focus on the adsorption approach towards direct air capture. Uh, so let's uh, uh, revise the conditions of air coming in, let's say, at room temperature, one bar, the concentration of CO2 is about 400 ppm. There is a lot of water, um, even a 50% relative humidity. Um, and of course, the rest is uh, basically nitrogen and oxygen. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a pictorial representation of, the, of, a, of a, for example, a Klamorx unit. But uh, it, what I'm showing here applies to any adsorption-based unit. And um, uh, there will be heat and electricity needed um, to obtain pure CO2, there will be water leaving the unit and CO2 lean air. So it's a separation where the ratio between CO2, water, and uh, the mixture oxygen-nitrogen is 1 to 28 to 2,500. So it's a very diluted uh, compound that we want to, uh, to extract. And there are essentially, I would say, three challenges that um, we would like to, um, to discuss. Um, I have a, a a comment, a question, let me have a look. Um, yeah. Okay, no, that was an internal communication, sorry. 
Um, um, so I, I was saying we have essentially three aspects, three challenges um, that we have to look at um, when we consider data data capture from an industrial perspective, and we have seen there are companies out there very active, but also from a research perspective, and this is the one that I'm interested in at the moment. So first of all, the material, the adsorbent, it has to have high loading at atmospheric CO2 pressures, it has to have a, a high good selectivity for CO2, um, possibly a low heat of absorption for to minimize the energy um, penalty during regeneration. It has to be stable both in dry air, but also in the presence of moisture, which will always be there. And uh, of course, a long lifetime. But then there is also the contactor that has uh, specific uh, challenges and characteristics, therefore. Uh, we need to have a low pressure drop, knowing that we will have to flow a large amount of air in order to recover the small fraction of CO2 that is present. We would like to have fast heat and mass transfer, of course, and a small footprint also. We don't want to have a gigant gigantic contactor um, to, to, to do the job. The third aspect is, of course, the process. Um, we know that the absorption separation processes are uh, always tailored and tuned and optimized for a specific application. In this case, there are some specific challenges. One is that the feed conditions might be varying because the temperature of the air is going to vary uh, and the relative humidity as well. How do we deal with this? Uh, we want to have high CO2 purity because we want to do something with this CO2 and productivity, of course. Um, energy is an issue as we want to keep it as low as possible. And at the end, we need to integrate the direct air capture in the, in, in, the, in the energy system. So system integration is a key issue. Let me go quickly through these three aspects. Um, uh, materials is not really, is not my specialty. Uh, so I give you a couple of examples. Basically, um, to, to give some uh, general messages. So the, the most effective materials so far are amine modified uh, uh, materials with amine grafted on, on some kind of support. Um, and the, this specific uh, case, you see here the, the reference, um, has allowed to achieve high selectivity of CO2. Um, absorption of CO2 is actually promoted by, by moisture. And um, it's important that the, that the, that the particles, that the support offers uh, high accessibility. The second material is the one that we also use in our simulations, and it's an amine functionalized nanofib, sorry, amine functionalized nanofibrillated cellulose, um, where again we have the group, um, amino silanes are grafted on a cellulose. Um, the mechanism is mainly chemisorption and uh, physisorption only to some extent. And um, also in this case, if you look at the, this is by the way, material that has been uh, proposed by, um, by, by, by Climeworks um, and they have reported data, uh, you see this here. So it, under dry condition, the gas absorbs um, with a favorable isotherm. So CO2 absorbs with this favorable isotherm at 23 degrees. But in the presence of humidity, high relative humidity, the absorption is even higher than that. So CO2 absorption is promoted by, by moisture. There are challenges, of course. Um, we need, uh, in order to be able to use, uh, to, to, to design uh, the process and also to um, use a model to, to, to accomplish this task, we need uh, um, uh, full and accurate data of kinetics and thermodynamics of co-absorption. And the lifetime, of course, is difficult to, to determine in general, to determine in general, sorry. So that is a capture contactor. What are the, the design principles? Well, um, we want to have low pressure drop because we want to flow a lot of air uh, to reduce OPEX. Of course, we would like to have a small footprint uh, to reduce CAPEX. Um, and uh, this means that we are going to have um, short beds, but very, with a very high uh, cross section. Uh, so pancakes, actually, as you should see here, we want to have a high uptake capacity to increase productivity and high mass transfer rate and high transfer rate to reduce uh, the cycle time and uh, be more productive. Um, in practice, in industry, I'm showing you data that I've, I've taken from, from patents. We see two concepts, at, at least reported in the open literature. Monoliths, as proposed by Global Thermostat, you see them here and here are the references. and. Um, uh, pack beds by, proposed by Climeworks, they are macrostructures. So the pack bag is here. Uh, the flow varies from left to right. Um, and this stiff rectangular frame in a pleated arrangement should minimize uh, the, the footprint. 
um, uh, the bed is packed with the sorbent particles in this case, and the heating is indirect through the tubing that you see in this uh, in these elements. When so in this case um, we are talking about direct heating and desorption via steam. Um, now let's come to the process. So the, um, these are the, the conditions for the separation of the composition of the mixture. Uh, and we have to realize that what we are doing here is more a, an extraction of a compound from, from a gas mixture that doesn't need to be purified. We are not interested in purifying air. We are interested in removing CO2. So the CO2 purity is the key parameter, not much CO2 recovery. Uh, and water is there, and it's very difficult to think that we can pretreat all the air that uh, we are feeding uh, to, 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 to dry it. Regeneration methods, we will see, we will use uh, vacuum temperature swing adsorption. Um, there are other options, I'm, I'm skipping this. Um, and any um, energy consumption is an issue, um, but in this case, we can use uh, mostly thermal energy. Uh, low grade heat is required because of the low temperature for regeneration. So. The, the cycle, I mean, one possible cycle that we have studied with our model is um, illustrated here. It's a four step cycle. The first step is adsorption. And here we want to saturate the bed because we want to capture as much as, uh, CO2 as possible um, as air flows through. Then we have um, evacuation of the column down to a vacuum pressure with partial removal of oxygen and nitrogen here. And the, the, the blowdown pressure is a key parameter. Um, we have then external heating to fully remove um, oxygen and nitrogen to obtain a pure CO2 product at the end and to reach a minimum temperature to avoid condensation of steam if we use steam. And finally, we have desorption of CO2 and water at the vacuum via external heating with or without steam purge. And the two key parameters are the duration of this uh, regeneration step or desorption step and the amount of steam that we use. In order to study this process, I show you one slide with examples of calculations. Uh, we use a standard one-dimensional model of an adsorption bed um, with, uh, I mean, this is all standard. We have used the, the adsorption isotherm that I showed you earlier um, for CO2 in the presence of water. And um, the model is very useful to understand the trade-offs between uh, the different uh, um, performance uh, indicators. Um, I show you two figures. Uh, from a paper that we have uh, submitted and hopefully we will publish soon. Um, here we see um, a plot uh, carried out with the same um, low pressure of 50 millibar um, at the different amounts of steam fed to the desorption step. Uh, gray is no steam, then the amount of steam increases, increases up to the uh, blue value here. And um, these curves are calculated by changing the regeneration time the longer the time, the higher the amount of CO2 that we capture, that we recover, but of course, it's also, uh, the productivity is reduced by the fact that the, the, the regeneration time is longer and we need more energy. So we see that for every amount of steam that we use, for example, the blue curve, there is an optimum where production of CO2 is maximum and um, specific thermal energy is at the minimum. And this uh, optimal point changes as we change the amount of steam. With no steam, we have, a, a lower production, true, minus 20% uh, than at this level, but a much lower specific thermal energy. So we see that there is a, a, a trade-off that we can play with. And uh, this diagram on the right summarizes um, some of our results. Uh, one important feature is that we need both. We need the thermal power and we need electric power. We need much more thermal power than electric power, to, but still um, the, the uh, we, we, we we might be in situations where we might play with, uh, with this uh, trade-off. And what we see here is for a given amount of uh, CO2 captured, uh, here a lower value and here a higher value, we see uh, the trade-off between the two forms of energy uh, at the specific levels of the uh, desorption pressure. And uh, the key point is that if, um, if you want to um, capture, let's say for lower amounts captured, we can work at a higher pressure for higher amounts captured, we have to work at a lower pressure. And uh, the model, as you see, is uh, um, a, for us an important um, uh, instrument tool to understand how to optimize the process and how to best, uh, um, uh, let's say, optimize its energy performance and how to best integrate it into the energy system. Um, now, 
I have now um, covered and presented the three technologies that I want to um, use um, to discuss how to make uh, uh, the chemical industry um, net zero CO2 emissions. And um, I, um, I promise to take questions at this point in time, but uh, if I look at the time, maybe it's better if I go on. But uh, I let you then uh, decide. If you want to take questions now, I'm happy to, um, to do it. If not, I can continue. Okay, I don't, I don't hear anything, so I continue. Um, a few moments to take some questions. One that's been submitted through the Zoom client uh, is the question, why is argon uh, present in air not considered during the absorption separation? Okay, I, I, heard, um, I heard you very poorly. Uh, you were broken and I, I couldn't understand what you said. I hope that you hear me better than I heard you. Let me just check the. To two microphone problems, let's just switch back to Marco and you can continue your seminar. Yeah, I, I, I cannot understand what, what, what you're saying. So I suggest I go on and then uh, when I finish, we, we see um, if we can exchange. And um, uh, my impression is that you, you can hear me well. So I'm, uh, I think it's the best uh, um, is uh, when I can continue with the webinar. Very good. So um, I'm, uh, um, as I said, the, the, I want to discuss with you how to make the chemical industry, let's say carbon neutral. And I will give you a picture that applies basically to any process. And then I will give you numbers about methanol. Methanol because it's an important chemical and because there, there is a lot of literature on me methanol so we have a certain confidence that we can, uh, we can um, um, uh, draw uh, con conclusions that uh, make sense from a quantitative point of view. I see a question from Handan Tezil. I would like to take it at the end. Now I continue with this, sorry. So, um, so let me, uh, let me um, then uh, um, show you my uh, a cartoon here to explain uh, um, what I want to say. So uh, this is a, a, an illustration of the chemical industry today. Uh, we basically start from, from oil or natural gas. So by producing it from the subsurface, there is a petrochemical plant that converts it into a product, this blue arrow, into a chemical that is used. This box represents use of a chemical. Uh, and after use, sooner or later, there will be emissions to the atmosphere. So that's the situation today. It's a, it's a situation where we have actually positive emissions, right? We, 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 uh, uh, and this is not what we want in, in, the, in the next years because of what I said at the very beginning. So we want to turn this uh, business as usual approach into something that um, delivers net zero CO2 emissions. How can we do it? Well, the first way we can do it is by capturing back the CO2 that has been emitted uh, using direct air capture and uh, storing it underground. This requires electricity, um, but it's a system that works. It's a CCS approach with direct air capture. There is a second approach, which is the one based on, on CCU. Um, this approach has basically from this point where we produce the chemical of interest, we use it and uh, we emit it, and then we capture it back, uh, the, we capture the CO2 back from the atmosphere, it's essentially the same as this scheme here. The difference is that CO2, instead of being stored underground, is sent to a plant where it is converted back into the chemical of interest. This requires a lot of energy, as I've clarified before, but let's say it can be done. It's a CCU approach with direct air capture to, um, to uh, win back the CO2 from the atmosphere after emission. And there is a third option, which is entirely based on biomass. Again, we have the chemical of interest, which is produced, used, emissions are ensue. Then CO2 is uptaken by the vegetation, um, uh, biomass grown for this purpose. And this biomass is transformed 
into the chemical of interest, for example, methanol in a dedicated plant. So all these three approaches work, they have different energy requirements. And these are illustrated here, actually for the four um, uh, cases that we have seen here. Um, and we see in purple power, we see in red heat. And uh, uh, business as usual requires a little of both because, uh, um, because the fossil fuel comes with its own energy, right? If we do CCS and directed capture, we need some heat, uh, but not much of electricity. If we want to follow this approach, we will need a lot of electricity, as we have already discussed, essentially to make hydrogen, right? The bio route has a, a, a low um, uh, energy requirement, uh, both in terms of power and of heat. So that's an indicator. We could think of drawing conclusions based on this, but we shouldn't before considering other elements. And one important element is uh, uh, the, the need of land to, in the case of CCU with direct air capture, to collect the renewable electricity that we need uh, for, to operate a CO2 conversion and uh, uh, to install the collectors for, for direct air capture. That's a, a number that we have calculated with the best accuracy, accuracy we could, 70 square meter per ton per year of methanol. The land needed for CCS DAC is, is minimal, of course, we need storage, but the land needed to implement a biomass uh, route is, uh, is huge. It's about 30 times more than what we do for, we need for uh, CCU duck. So we see that there is a, um, there is a trade off here uh, among these three solutions. And uh, um, we have also to keep in mind one thing that these energy needs. Um, are those that are need, that are so we assume that all these energy, this electricity and heat, are perfectly carbon free. Okay, um, and if this is the case, these energy requirements deliver in this case methanol um, with net zero CO two emissions. So they achieve, they fulfill the requirement, they achieve our goal. But of course, electricity is not carbon free. Um, particularly today. So let's look at what happens when uh, uh, we consider a carbon intensity of the electricity on the horizontal axis here, so tons of CO2 per megawatt hour, um, and what this implies in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. So the numbers that you see here refer to the origin, where we have a carbon intensity of electricity which is zero, and we have accordingly net zero emissions. But as soon as the electricity has, uh, so uh, is produced by using um, fossil fuels, you see here the carbon intensity of electricity in the European Union, around 0.4 tons of CO2 per megawatt hour. Uh, this is the value in Switzerland or in France that uses a lot of nuclear, it's very low. Um, so, but, but um, um, as soon as, as we consider the carbon intensity of electricity, well, First of all, as far as business as usual solution that is not a net zero, it emits CO2 already today, as we discussed, but it doesn't use electricity. So basically it's a CO2 emission level does not change much with the carbon intensity of electricity. In the case of CCS where the electricity requirement is low, well, there is an increase of the emissions, but uh, you see that we are below the business as usual case, even uh, for the average carbon intensity of the European Union. But for CCU that has a huge amount of electricity that is needed, the slope of this curve is very, is very steep. And um, we see that, for example, if we take the energy mix of the European Union, um, implementing CCU today would emit CO a double amount of CO2 than by, by making methanol as we do today and letting the emissions um, uh, go. So CCU does not make sense unless the uh, carbon intensity of electricity is extremely low. And also in that case, well, we need to consider the fact that, that the renewable carbon-free elect electricity will be needed by us in our society in many different ways. Um, I have two slides to, to, to tell you that uh, the same concepts apply. So we have talked now about the, the chemical industry with these uh, three alternatives. Uh, but these three alternatives, I mean, um, we've talked about methanol, but if we talked about uh, jet fuels, for example, which is another sector, aviation, that can not be decarbonized easily, um, we would have the same situation. 
And um, if, we, uh, if we ignore for a minute the biofuel option, um, we could compare how uh, making jet fuels with the CCS direct capture approach or um, making synthetic fuels. And um, also in this case, you would need a huge amount of electricity. And what I want to show you here is that if we, I, I would like to, to show you how and where we are going to spend this electricity in the complex uh, technology chain that allows us to reuse CO2 and make, for example, in this case, um, methanol as a metaphor for jet fuels. Well, if we start with an electricity input of 100% of renewable carbon-free electricity, uh, we would have a loss. Um, uh, so we would have to spend almost 30% of it to make hydrogen, another 23% of it to recover CO2 from air after emission, um, only 11%, 10% of it for the fuel synthesis. And, um, and then there is a loss uh, during the combustion of the fuel. And in the end, we would be able to exploit and use only 13% of the um, input uh, carbon-free electricity for propulsion. Okay, so there is a 90%, almost 90% loss. And you see that the loss associated to the synthesis of the fuel is only 10%. It's very, very small. And this is where um, catalysis, uh, catalysis can, have, can have an influence, um, which is minimal, as you see. Now, there is another application, which is uh, interesting. I go quickly through this because I would like to finish in two minutes. Um, the key point is that we can use, uh, um, we can, actually can use synthetic fuels for seasonal energy storage. And this is a very important application. So in, a, in the context of a power, for example, methane power um, solution, where what we want to achieve is we want to store intermittent electricity in a chemical fuel and uh, this chemical fuel is used then when electricity is needed and the renewable electricity is not available. And in this case, because of the higher efficiency of combustion, for example, in a gas fire power plant, we can have a much higher um, output. So from the 100% we start with, we can recover 28% after storing of this electricity. But we have to consider that we might want to use different types of uh, synthetic fuels. Um, so not necessarily carbon-based, like methane and methanol, but we could use directly hydrogen and ammonia. And we see that in terms of net cycle efficiency, hydrogen does a much better job than, um, than carbon rich fuels based on CCO. I'm coming to my conclusions. And now I, I, I take one minute to, to summarize um, my talk. So, uh, and I use this cartoon here. Uh, the goal was to say how we can make the chemical industry net zero CO2 um, emissions. And uh, well, the good news is that we have basically three approaches, one based on CCS plus direct air capture, the other one based on CCU with direct air capture, and the third one based on the use of biomass. And we've seen uh, in terms of energy, what the situation is in terms of land use, etc. So it might well be that there are different geographical and industrial situations where one or the other is better or will be better in the future. So that's a good, the, 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 the good news part of the talk, if you like. But uh, all three solutions face a challenge. And um, for bio, for the use of biomass, clearly land use is an issue. Um, and co conflict in the use of the land, of course. For CCU, energy needs are certainly an issue, and we have discussed it in, in depth. And uh, for CCS, data capture, uh, we need to have a storage site. And uh, I mean, there are many places on earth where we can store CO2, but certainly not everywhere. And certainly, uh, well, they need to be, to be explored, identified and exploited. So each of the three solutions has a specific hurdle. But I would like to say that um, CCS DAC is special in at least two ways. The first is that, well, it can be retrofitted on the existing solution, right? So the, the chemical plant that converts fossil fuel into the desired product, chemical product, exists. And we need to retrofit uh, this with the direct capture plant that would be needed also in the case we want to implement CCU and with the storage site. And the second is, if we now single out this part of the cycle, so from CO2 in the atmosphere, recapture captured using direct capture and then stored underground, this is exactly the negative emission technology, the so-called DAX, that we will need 
in the second part of the century if you overshoot the 1.5 degrees limit uh, of global warming. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I will be happy to discuss with you uh, if we manage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mazzotti. Um, there is a slight problem with Dan's uh, side of the audio, so I'll be asking you the questions. Very good, thank you. So the first question is, uh, why isn't argon present in air uh, not considered during the adsorption, adsorption separation? Well, because, uh, because uh, it stays with oxygen and nitrogen. I mean, I've, uh, of course, uh, there is argon in air, but uh, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not important and relevant in, uh, in the context of the other capture. And it's not absorbed, uh, let's say, by the uh, adsorbents that are used. OK. Uh, the next question, uh, how do pressure drop and mass transfer kinetics differ from monoliths versus uh, packed bed systems? Is there an optimum? I, I don't know the answer. Uh, we are working on it. We are exploring it. Um, it's a very important question. And um, it allows me to say uh, something that I wanted to say, but I forgot, that um, I think that data capture is, a, uh, is an important technology. It will be an important technology. I think that absorption uh, is, uh, in my opinion, uh, one of the good ways to do it, but there are a lot of things that have to be understood. So I think it's, a, it's an excellent playground for our community. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, to answer questions such as the one that you have just asked. Okay. Uh, next question. What is the time scale over which the sorbent and CCS DAC captures the CO2? I didn't understand the answer. It's Can probably a um, question about uh, kinetics. Uh, are they, do they have fast kinetics or if the kinetics are slow? Um, I would say that they are fast. Um, but again, also this is something, you know, on, on these adsorbents, on these materials, uh, uh, there is not a lot of research that has already been done. So um, we know that the data from, uh, from uh, information from the companies uh, but um, uh, I don't have solid uh, data and experiments to, to answer this. But uh, my impression is that it's, it's relatively fast, but it has certainly, there are certainly opportunities to improve it. Okay, um, next question. Um, I would like to know if life cycle assessment can be used to evaluate the efficiency of a net zero CO2 process. It, it has to be used to make such assessment. What I've shown you here is a first order um, systemic analysis where I, lo where I look at some aspects of it. Um, you have seen that there were papers cited that we have recently published where we make a point in arguing that um, it's important to carry out a simplified life cycle analysis like the one that I've shown you because it allows you to understand which solutions are worth a, a, an in-depth uh, life cycle analysis that is uh, normally, require, that requires a lot of data that are difficult to collect. But the answer to your question is definitely yes, we will need it, but possibly after selecting, um, uh, selecting the, the solutions that are promising uh, by doing a, a simplified analysis, that looks at material balances and energy balances uh, very much along the lines that I've shown you. Because some of the things I've shown you seem very simple, I believe, but they are not presented in this simple way very often. And I, I, I believe that they help to understand uh, some key differences among at least the three solutions that you see on, on, on this slide. Okay, so the, the next question, what is the main contributor to the energy consumption in the adsorption process and CCSDA and CCUDAC? So um, the, the, um, so the, uh, in the case of, I, I have a slide on this. If you allow me, I, um, I have to see if I can. 
So let, let, let's focus on, I mean, there are many things on this slide, but let's focus on, on, uh, um, on two things. Um, so first of all, the left uh, uh, hand side bar chart is about electricity and the right hand side is about um, heat. And um, uh, you, you see six technologies, but let's focus on two. That, is, that are the ones that I've shown in my, in my cartoon. Uh, so CCS with direct air capture, and CCU with data capture for electricity, and CCS for data capture, and CCU for data capture for heat. Let's focus on electricity. So um, if you look at CCU with data capture, we have the gray part of the bar is methanol production, the blue part is data capture, and the red part is hydrogen production. And uh, pay attention to the fact that there is a break here. So uh, this level is 1.5 megawatt hour per ton of methanol, and then we jump to 10. So you see that the, the, the hydrogen production is, is, the big, uh, is the big contributor here. While in the case of CCS DAC, we have basically similar amounts of, of um, uh, like for CCU DAC, for methanol production and data capture. Um. There are a couple of questions uh, also from YouTube, so I will probably limit it to two questions before we wrap up. Um, so there are two questions concerning uh, the materials. So one is about uh, what would be the contribution of new materials and, um, and also uh, about uh, how does water enhance the adsorption of CO2 in the materials that you had spoken about? So... Um, the mechanism um, that causes um, water enhancement um, seems to be, from my understanding, and you know that this is not uh, my, 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 uh, my area, my understanding is that um, um, uh, there is uh, the, the formation of bicarbonate uh, that, can, um, that adds on the absorption of CO2 as such. And this bicarbonate, of course, forms only in the presence of, of water. And um, in terms of contribution, well, actually, frankly, um, the question was asked by Armin Rajendran, I think that you are the person who should answer this question because you have uh, recently published a paper on post-combustion capture where you were analyzing the possibilities of uh, um, uh, improvement in performances uh, by playing with, uh, let's say, um, uh, theoretical and potential properties of, adsor of new adsorbents, plus with the properties of existing adsorbents. And um, uh, I mean, the conclusions of that work were that uh, the, for post-combustion capture, that the, the, the room for improvement is not huge, right? With respect to existing materials. Um, in the case of data capture, this study has to be, has to be carried out. But um, my gut feeling is that um, maybe the, there will be there, there might be uh, improvements, if you look at this slide, more in terms of in increasing the lifetime than um, uh, as far as the, the, the absorption performance are concerned. But it's only gut feeling. I'm, I'm not working that way. So I will just ask one last question. There are, there's a huge interest both on YouTube and here, but I think in the interest of time, we will probably uh, stop. So the last question comes from, uh, from Farouk in, uh, in Singapore. So his question is, we want uh, strong adsorption and fast kinetics. And we know that these usually work in, in opposite directions. Um, so where do you find the typical optimum on this? Yeah, it's a similar question as before. I, I don't have the answer. Uh, I don't have the answer. I mean, I, I agree. And... Um, and I, again, I, I answer, it's a very convenient answer. Uh, I, I answer by saying that uh, um, we need answers to this question and we need research by uh, scholars in the field of absorption that, uh, who address these problems. Okay, so I think that kind of brings us to an end. There are plenty of questions coming both here and on YouTube, so I'm, I'm glad that we have uh, sufficient interest. Um, so, but I think at this point we will have to conclude today's session. Uh, Dan, would you like to take over? Uh, so Dan asked me to uh, 
uh, read the last part. He's still having some problems with uh, with his okay. computer. Yeah. So do you have uh, the close up slides, uh, Nick? Or um, Dan does. I'm communicating through the uh, text. So uh, I just have to ask uh, you, Dr. Mizzotti, to uh, stop sharing your screen, and then Dan will be able to uh, pull up his presentation. Okay. Yeah, I think we are. Uh, okay. So thank you, Professor Mazzotti, for your outstanding webinar on CO2 capture and storage and the process engineering challenges it presents. We also thank all of our attendees for joining this webinar and hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. Please join us again tomorrow at the same time when Professor Andreas seidel Morgenstern of MPI Magdeburg and president of the IAS presents a webinar on qualitative connection between adsorption isotherms and retention times of breakthrough curves. I hope you all can join us. So I need to let him know. Yeah, thank you. Next slide. Next week, we will have three additional webinars. Please watch both the IAS website and our Twitter feed for updates and additional announcements. Additional webinars are planned for the week of May the 5th. Lastly, we ask that you consider joining IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our dues are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal, Adsorption. Contribute to travel grants and workshop seed funding for IES members and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of adsorption. Members also receive free access to IES supported materials, including our journal, as well as the adsorption database published by Springer Materials. With that, we thank you again for joining our webinar, and we hope that you will join us for future editions and for other events associated with the IES and members. Excellent.